Welcome to John Gets Games. Today, I'll be reviewing Dynasties. This is a three to five player game that has you trying to take over Europe through marriage, essentially. The quirk here is that when you actually get married with your family members, you are marrying a member from an opponent's family, and it is beneficial for both of you. There are I Split You Choose mechanics strewn throughout this Euro game that ultimately relies on quite a bit of area uh, control. So first, I'll show you how to play the game, and then I'll jump into my review. Here's a starting setup for a four player game of Dynasties. Each player takes all the people of their color, as well as a starting hand and two green scoring cards. What players will be trying to do is to grab these colored bricks, mostly from the trading area, and spend them to do various things like uh, send family members to the cities on the map and start marriages, as well as uh, seek the favor of some of these uh, personality cards over here, and also activating some special bonus actions on their cards. The structure of a turn is quite simple. On a player's turn, they simply play one of the cards from their hand or they pass. Now, each of these cards has symbols in the top left and top right, which can show you some of the four basic actions. In fact, this joker right here has all four of the basic actions there, so let's go ahead and take a look at those first. Now, if we look here, we see a little ship action, and this is the first one I want to talk about. If the red player had discarded this card and said they were taking a trade action, they would then take one of their people and put it down on one of these boats. Now, whenever you put a person into a boat and they're the first one there, they have to go on this larger spot. It's kind of a dominant position, and the other one is a secondary position, and usually I put the figures face down when they're in those spots. Now what this means is this person is staking a claim on some of the goods on this boat, but they won't get to take any of them until somebody else comes along and goes into that secondary spot. So that would finish the red player's turn, and now let's say that the yellow player decides they want to do the same. They discard this card because it has this trading symbol on it, and instead of going into an empty ship, they decide to go into the ship that the red player is already in. Now what happens is these bricks need to get split up. The person who played the uh, secondary character, the one lying down, will then split this pile of bricks into two different piles, and then the person who played the primary character will get to pick one of those piles and take all those bricks, and the secondary person will get the remainder. In this case, the yellow player might make the two piles like this. The red player could choose to take this pile of three. They could also take the two, but this is probably better for them. It's more bricks. And then the yellow player would take these. These people will get cleared off, and five more cubes will be randomly taken out of the bag and put down on the board. The next action type is this personality blue icon here. So a player could discard this card right here in order to activate any of these personalities. This one right here is free, but the rest of them cost a certain number of these blue bricks in order to activate them. And they do a variety of things. For instance, this roll right here will let the player take one brick from each of the uh, trading ships down there. This one right here lets you the player roll the three marriage dice and pick two of them, and those, that'll make sense in a little bit. And this one over here lets a player make a marriage. I'm not going to go into the specifics of them, but for the most part, they're really good actions. And once the player has activated that specific personality, you flip it over so that nobody else can use it for the rest of this round. The third basic action option is this white rose symbol, and when you spend this, it allows you to put a duchess down on the board. Now, in order to do this, you need to spend the appropriate number of white bricks in order to put them into the right spot. So, if we want to put it into Paris, that would cost three of these white bricks, and you'll notice that there is a large box and a small box. So, this is a small box, so we put it laying down, but instead, if we had spent just two white bricks, we could put it in Carcassonne. Now, this duchess is in the primary situation, and they're standing up, and if a prince was to go in here, well, they'd be laying down. And this leads us to our fourth and final basic action option, which is this black sword, which, as you probably guessed, is just putting a prince down on the board. So if the green player wanted to go into Carcassonne, it would only cost them one of these black bricks, and they would go laying down like that to show they are a secondary figure. It's important to note that you're never allowed to put two of your own figure in a city. That would be marrying your sister or brother, and that's just uh, frowned upon in this situation. As soon as the city has a prince and a duchess, a marriage occurs. When that happens, the player who is in the secondary role will roll these three marriage dice, and then, much like the trading ships, they're going to split these three dice into two different piles, and the player who is in control of the primary spot will get to pick one pile, and then the uh, secondary spot will get to take the remainder. In this case, the green player might split it like this, and the red player, they might decide they want to take this pile. And what this means is the red player would just get one victory point, and you'll notice that this is just a d6, so it can go from one to six victory points, depending on how it rolled. This right here lets the player grab two random bricks out of the bag, so just getting bricks is definitely a good thing. And this symbol uh, will match this spot on the board, you might notice. This is having a baby. When a player has a baby, they're able to take one of their tokens and put it in the baby slot on any city where they are a participant in a marriage and there is not already a baby. So it does not necessarily have to go into this city. It could go somewhere else on the map where green is already in a marriage, but there is no child. And this baby will count as plus one when it comes to area majority for the France region. And it's also worth noting another possible outcome is getting a free trade action as well as taking a crest of these different colors 
these all count as plus one uh, area control in the given regions as well. I might have gotten a little ahead of myself. It's also worth noting that whenever you put a character into a city, you are usually going to get a benefit. Right here, we see that Carcassonne would give a player two victory points. So in this case, red would have gotten two points and green would have gotten two points when they placed the uh, Duchess and Prince into the city. This uh, city here of Dijon has these two book symbols. Uh, when a player places a figurine into this city, they take the top book symbol, flip it over, and get a random benefit. This happens to be uh, plus three victory points, but this could also be extra cubes or more of... Uh, well, they could show a sigil like this, but they would keep that hidden for the rest of the game, so they'd have a little bit of hidden majority in a given region. This spot with the anchor is associated with some scoring cards, and finally, this plus one for the bag gets the player one random cube out of the bag. The last symbol is this crown, and that's more of an endgame victory point thing, and I'll cover that later. So now let's look at the special golden actions. Every card, except for the jokers, has one down here, and we see right here it shows the symbol of York and a single gold brick. That means the player can spend this card here, as well as one brick back to the bag in order to put a uh, supporter figure into the city of York. And they could put it either in the prince slot or the duchess spot. At this point, they for sure do the duchess spot. They essentially got three white bricks worth of value out of that single cube. And of course, like normal, they would take the uh, top book action here. And well, looks like they have a hidden blue uh, support for the rest of the game for that blue player. There are two other special actions I want to cover, although this is not all of them. This one right here allows the player to spend a single gold brick in order to get two trade ship actions. So they could just pop both of these down for the cost of the single gold brick, which is pretty great. And this one right here allows the player to spend a single gold brick in order to use the ability that is on these two personalities. You may have noticed they're kind of off on their own in this little segregated spot. You can only access these abilities on a turn where you are able to play this special card that has that unlock ability. This seems like a good opportunity to talk about scoring cards. If they were to have evaluated this card, they would draw three yellow scoring cards and keep a single one of them. These golden scoring cards will allow the player to get victory points for doing a variety of different things. For instance, uh, you can play these at the end of every round. This one would give the player seven points if they have the uh, most or equal to the most black bricks at that time. And then these will give a variety of points depending on the round number and the various board situation they have with their different um, uh, supporters out on the map. So in this case, they might discard both of these and then keep this uh, hidden in a face down uh, pile in their area. Each player also started the game with two of these green scoring cards, and these are all alike. They all show two different cities on them, and when you evaluate the scoring card, you will get four points if you have presence in one of these cities, and 12 points in this instance if you're in both of these cities. But as you can see, it's different depending on the strength of the city, so on this card, it's only three and 10 points. Instead of playing a card on a player's turn, they could instead choose to pass. They will stay passed for the rest of the round, and when they pass, they go to the front of this line here. However, if they choose to, they can spend one, two, or three of these pink bricks back to the bag in order to go on these specific spots, which allows them to have uh, essentially jump in line. There could have already been a player right here, and if they'd spent two bricks, they jump in line and get first dibs at the uh, player order, as well as some bonuses at the end of the round. Once all players have passed, the round ends and several stages of upkeep happen. One of the things is that in this order, the players will evaluate one of these bonuses. This top one can be evaluated by as many people as they want at three points each. This spot right here would be three random bricks out of the bag, and once the player goes on there, nobody else can. This spot gives more cards, uh, well, a single, another card from the draw for the following turn, and there's a variety of other options that these give for the players, and they're going to go ahead and take these, and once they're all done, you move on. Before players start the next round, they need to do some scoring. As you can see, this tile right here has a one. This is for the end of the first turn, and this says that every player who has a single family member out on the board that is in a dominant position will get four victory points, uh, each, and then for each one that is in the secondary position, we'll get two points. So essentially, you get victory points for your unmarried people. In this situation, the red player right here is in the secondary position, so this pawn right here would be worth two victory points to the red player. Once you've evaluated this for everybody, this will be flipped over, and there will be a different set of scoring at the end of the second round. Once we get to that second round, it'll be six points and three points for each of these single um, lords and ladies that are out on the board. But then, importantly, you will need to spend one pink brick back to the bag for each one of your single princes and duchesses. And if you don't, then they actually leave the board and go off to the nunnery. So you definitely need pink bricks in the, at the end of that second round. 
The last thing players do before they move into the next round is they can actually spend their scoring cards. Now, you're allowed to keep two scoring cards between rounds, so in this situation, this player would want to spend at least one of these. Let's say they have um, the same amount of bricks as the person who has the most, so they could go ahead and discard this in order to get seven victory points right away, but they might not have a pair in both of these situations yet, so they might hold onto each of these cards. You can spend as many of these scoring cards in rounds as you want, but you can also store two, so they might keep these. And speaking of hand limits, players are only allowed to keep one of these blue Ashen cards between rounds, so odds are good they won't actually have more than one available to them after the scoring round, but on the off chance they do, they'll have to discard down until they only have one. And somewhat importantly, that happens before the player would potentially draw another card for the next round. Once players have evaluated the second round, we move to the third round and final round of the game, and once we go into scoring, we're actually going to do area majority for each of the countries, which you can see with this symbol on the board. At this point, we look at each individual country, and the player who has the most strength in that given country will get the number one slot. So in this case, blue has two, yellow has one, green has two, and red has one. But blue had this symbol from earlier in the game, which he'll now reveal, to show they have the most, so they will get 10 victory points. And then the second place player will be green, who would get six. Finally, we have this crown bonus here. Now, for every player who has at least one um, person in every crown within a given country, we'll get this amount of points. In France, there is only one crown, so both blue and yellow, in this case, would get six victory points. But as you can see up here in Britannia, where there are two crown cities, only the red player will get this bonus of four points because they're in both of them, whereas the green and yellow player are only present in one. Once this area scoring is done and players have spent all of their scoring cards, you see who has the most victory points, and that person's the winner. Let's now begin the review for Dynasties, and I'm going to start with a few positive points. The first of these relates to really the jewel of this game, and that is the I Split You Choose mechanisms that are in two main parts. The first of these is the Marriage Dice, which is when you marry off one of your family members to an opponent, and then the person with kind of the secondary figure rolls these three dice and then has to split them into two uh, piles. One's obviously going to have one die and one's going to have two. And this is a wonderful decision because uh, one of these dice is just going to give you a bunch of victory points, um, depending, it could be actually a very small amount or a large amount, depending on the die roll, and then you could also get crests, which will help you out with area majority, and then you might also just get bonus actions like a trade action, or put a baby down on the board, which is going to help you out with area majority. So there are a bunch of different things that these dice can do, and that that splitting choice is really difficult, oftentimes. Sometimes it's, you know, oh wow, you know, you rolled a one victory point, and these two things, well you just split it that way and it's over with. But usually, when those dice are rolled, the, the player who's deciding is thinking about it for at least 20 to 30 seconds before they do it, so that um, when their opponent picks one of these two, that they're still going to get a good pick. And I love the variety of actions that you can get from this. It's it's a die roll. <laughs> you throw these dice, I mean, obviously by definition. And I enjoy that. Now, I will admit, sometimes you'll roll the dice and it's a very lackluster set. But in general, it provides good decisions. The other spot where you have ice split you choose is in the trading uh, part of the game, where you have these boats with four to five uh, resources in them. And then you have to split those up. And so usually it's five. And that means you're usually doing a pile of two bricks and a pile of three bricks. I don't think I've ever seen anyone go one and four. I don't think that one would have been that good for anybody at this point in the game. Usually it's two and three. And that's also just wonderful because you're trying to figure out what you want to do and what your opponent is looking to do. Sometimes you can actually put it in your favor by putting the two that your opponent probably really wants. Then you get three bricks out of it. So it's just a wonderful way to balance out the random uh, draw from the bag with the bricks and the random die roll from those marriage dice. You really have the players balancing things out so that things aren't too swingy, and I just really love their integration into the game. Positive number two relates to the five different resources and the cool way that the game decides to tackle them. Like your average Euro, if you see, oh yeah, of course there's a variety of resources, I'm probably gonna be spending a, a blue and a pink and a white to do this, and then like maybe two blacks and one blue to do that, but not in this game. You actually kind of segregate them out to each do their own thing. If you have black bricks, you're only going to use them to put princes out on the board. If you have blue bricks, you're only going to use them to hire those personalities. And I think that's pretty neat because you look at the resources that are down in front of you and you get kind of a snapshot of what some of your options are because you are not mixing and matching. It's not like there's a card row where things cost different amounts. No, you just look down and these are directly analogous to actions. Now, the more you have of a specific color will get you a better action, maybe a better placement out on the board if you spend a bunch of the white bricks, or you could grab one of the personalities that's just a little bit expensive in this particular round. And I really enjoy that. The pink bricks are definitely the weakest because they let you manipulate the turn order at the end of the round, which is important, and it's also quite important to spend those so you don't lose your people to the nunnery at the end of that second round so that you can continue to score them for victory points in uh, the area majority. But the game kind of acknowledges that pink is the least interesting one, so it says, well, you can use two pinks to be a wild of the other ones. And I think it just all comes together 
really neat. I, I enjoy seeing that in this game. It's definitely a new take on just having a variety of different colored cubes or bricks in your game. Positive number three also relates to those bricks, but in a broader scope to the entire game as a package. And that is just, I love the look of this game. I feel like this is how a Euro game should look. It's got vibrant, popping colors. It's got beautiful art all over the place. And sure, it's still just a map of Europe. And you've seen that so many times in Euro games, but they made it so colorful. You know, France is nice and blue and England is nice and red. You've got these bricks, which are great colors. They're also bricks, which is kind of odd. They're not cubes and how much I'm more I like them as being bricks, like that little novelty value. It just looks cooler on the table. It feels cooler in your hand. I enjoy the fact that they're not uh, cubes. And when you also just look at the personalities and everything, now sure, there are lots of tropey things here. You have laurels for victory points. And again, you have a big map of Europe. We've seen that a hundred times, but I just love the variety and color they have in here. Even the box art is vibrant and colorful and interesting on the front cover where you kind of see a woman looking down on a marriage that's happening and it's like, yep, there's some power play going on there. I just really enjoy the entire package of it, and it just looks great on the table. It's a pretty big map, and yeah, just a great package. So now let's move into a few neutral points, and the first of these relates to the surprisingly tactical nature of this game. Now, I was expecting a reasonable amount of tactics, uh, because I knew there were multi-use cards that you're going to draw and kind of figure out what you can do based off of those in this one given round, and I love that in games. But what I was not expecting was the interplay between that and these um, these bricks that I talked about. At the beginning of the game, you have zero bricks in front of you. So that starting hand of cards, well, you're not thinking about all the interesting, cool combos you can do. You're thinking, I need bricks. How do I get bricks? Oh, I probably just do a trading action to throw my person out there and put them on a boat. I mean, if you're the starting player and you have a personality um, action in your hand, you're probably going to play that because the when you randomly shuffle those personalities up, one of them is always free, so, you know, not spending bricks is great. You'll probably do that because most of these personalities are good. But everybody else, they're probably just going to do trade actions. And if you're lucky, somebody else trades on there, and you start to get bricks, and you can start to formulate what you're going to do on that given turn. But these two layers really make it very tactical, like making an overarching strategy uh, for a given round, let alone the three-round game, is quite difficult. You are always dancing around, and even when you do that trade action, it's not like you know what bricks you're going to get. It depends on how your opponent splits them up if you're the first person to go there or how you split it up and how your opponent grabs them. Odds are good when you do a trade action, you're going to get at least one brick that you really wanted, but that second or third brick might be a bit of a crapshoot and then you need to once again look at the cards in your hand and figure out what you can do. And you could definitely have situations where it feels like you have your bricks and your cards don't match and so then you have this new layer of tactics where you're trying to make the best of this hand that you have that you're given and that's fine, but I was expecting it to be a little bit more of a 50-50 strategy to tactics game, and it feels like it's more like a 70-30 uh, split, and that may be a little bit more than I wanted, and it's definitely going to be more than your average Euro experience that people are going to go into this game expecting. Neutral number two relates directly to those personality tiles that are shuffled up and put out on the board. And on the face of it, I really like that kind of mechanic in games. You kind of shuffle these things up, and it's got varying levels of worth in a given round. But Strictly the fact that one of them is free every round makes it kind of swingy as far as the overall power of the first player. Now, you can dictate who the first player is going to be based on prior rounds, usually on you know placing these pink cubes down, but you might split it up and put these personalities down so that the free one is really not that interesting or really not that good for the starting player. Or it could be the one that lets you st steal one brick from all three boats, and then it's a complete no-brainer as long as the player has a card in their hand that lets them activate that personality. So it can be quite swingy and very random with the way that you parse these out and then two of them are locked out every round, which is also kind of neat. You need to spend a special card in order to access those two. But it's just, I thought it was worth noting that because this is fully randomized, it, it can be a bit swingy. I almost wish it was a bit more of a conveyor belt situation where like all the ones that were taken become more uh, expensive on the next round. The ones that weren't taken shuffle down. Uh, some sort of situation like that might have made it a little bit more balanced and predictable, and I feel like a little more predictability in this game in general would have probably been nice. And neutral number three is a simple feeling that you often have when you're playing this game of, man, I am just not doing enough. How do I do more? I've constantly had a grass is greener vibe when I'm playing the game. I look at out the opponents, I'm like, oh my gosh, they're doing stuff and I'm not doing things. Um, in the first round, the second round, the third round of the game, and I've talked to my opponents and they oftentimes have that same feeling. And some people really like that aspect to specific board games where it just feels like they're always playing from behind and everybody's playing from behind and obviously someone's going to end up winning. But that's not always my favorite way to play a game. Like I want to feel like I'm accomplishing things and if I'm constantly feeling like I'm scrabbling to just try and stay even with everybody else, even though that might not be the case, it's just a vibe I get, no, that's a 
uh, emotional impression that I want you to know that you might have when you go into this game. I now want to go into my one negative for the game, but it's a bit of a doozy. I've alluded to this a little bit already earlier in the review, and that is that the card play mechanism in this game, it just feels a bit clunky, and it honestly feels a bit unnecessary. When you add in the tactical level of what cards you draw and what abilities they're going to give you access to with the bricks that are going to allow you to do them, there have been several times where players have been incredibly frustrated because they draw those four cards at the beginning of one of the three rounds in the game. There's only three rounds when these big draws happen, and they have no personality draws, for instance, and they, and they have blue tile bricks in front of them, especially if it's the third round. Those blue bricks are completely pointless. And, you know, sure, that was a bit unlucky that they did that, but I've seen situations like this happen where you draw zero ability to put duchesses down and you've been saving up these white bricks from the last round to do a big push. And now you might put that on the player like, oh, they, they shouldn't have done that. They should have been a little bit more tactical in the previous round and tried to play cards around that. But maybe they did and they just did not have the, um, the cards to put those duchesses down in the prior round either. That might be why they have all these white bricks because people can see they're not being able to utilize them. And I just don't like that. I really enjoy the um, the gold brick actions that are on these cards, and I feel like maybe if every card was a joker, so it had all four of the main actions on it and then a bonus action, that would have alleviated this issue. So I guess it's not that I feel like the card play mechanism should not be in the game at all. I just feel like the extra layer of randomness that it gives you when you are trying the cards into your hand is just really not good. Like it almost makes me feel like I should do a hand draft at the beginning of every round. Like, okay, we've all drawn our cards. Okay, now pick one and shoot, pass it to the left so that you have some control. And this game is all about control through randomness with the ice split you choose mechanisms. You know, you roll those dice, you pull those out of the bag, but then the players figure out how to balance it for everybody else. But then you just have drawing these cards from the top of the stack. It feels like almost you should ice split you choose the cards. That, but that would make the game a little bit too complicated. So I am pretty disappointed with the restrictions that that blind card draw can add into the game, and it can definitely make people feel like they were knocked out of contention for really no reason of their own. I mean, if there was, I do like the fact that the bricks can only do one thing and then they can't do anything else, but when you're hampered by the card draw and that uh, restriction on the bricks, that's a very frustrating experience that has hit uh, several people when I've been playing the game, uh, including me at one point, so it's, it's definitely a flaw that I see with the game. It's just one too many random things going on, and this one in particular, players have no control over. When it comes to the replayability for Dynasties, I think it's slightly above average, and it's really spot on for what I would have hoped to get out of this box for a euro of this weight. You randomize the tiles that show how much victory points you get for area majority in the given countries, and I know for other games, they would have had those printed on the board. And when you think about it, there's there is something to be said for that because, you know, France is a little interesting. It only has one crown on it. So if it has a really high scoring crown thing, then that's an incentive to go there. But I do like that, well, the, the players just need to kind of self-balance that and see that France right now is much better this game than it was in the last game. And that makes going there more incentivized. Well, there's your replayability a little bit. I, I think that, you know, the die rolls and the way they split and the decisions you're going to go off those is definitely going to make one game play a little bit different from the next. Like in one game, you might have the opportunity to really push out on the board with a bunch of people, uh, especially early in the game, whereas the next, you might not be given those opportunities and you're going to try to figure out how to get victory points in a different way. And so, yeah, in general, I think it's a little above, above average. Dynasty supports three to five players, and I've played the three and four player game, and I think that four players is definitely the sweet spot. In the three player game, and I actually played a couple of those, it seemed like, it could take a while before people really started to marry each other. Like, I, there have situations where you complete the entire first round and everybody is single. No marriages happen at all. And at the end of the three-player game, there are quite a few marriages. Like, marriage is a thing that happens, but it feels like it comes a bit late. And you also have a pretty real possibility of two players marrying each other more than the third, just kind of due to circumstance. And those players are really benefiting. Like, even when, um, you know, you split those dice up, one person's going to get a slightly better trade than the other. But the person who's really missing out is the person who's not in this marriage at all. So in a four-player game, there's going to be more marriages. I think it's more likely that everybody's kind of going to be evenly married. And I've not tried the five-player game, but you uh, add four extra cities to the board. And so I imagine it plays somewhat similar to the four-player game, just longer. And I don't think it really needs to be longer. Uh, one other thing about the three-player game is that since you are not restricting the cities, not only does it make it harder to get married, but it makes the area majority a little bit more open and you're a lot more likely to just hit... Uh, ties with the area majority, which makes it a little bit less tight and interesting of an aspect of the game. In conclusion, I really wanted to love this game. 
the um, aspects of I Split You Choose are just brilliantly implemented in this game where you have this randomness, but then the players control it and really try to balance it out between themselves. You have this vibrant, beautiful board. You've got a little bit of area majority, which I'm not usually crazy about, but I like it in small doses like this game seems to give you. But I really run into a brick wall of the issues I have with the random card draw. It's soured the game for a couple of my friends. It soured the game for me. And it, I really wish I could fix it. Like with some sort of house rule. I guess I could just house rule that every single card uh, is a joker. But that's a pretty big change to the game. And I just really want, I don't want that extra layer of force, tactic, t force tactics and randomness that the game puts in there. I'm not sure if I'm going to be keeping the game. I, I think it's very likely I'll play it again at some point in the future because I really love some of these ideas that the game is injecting in and I can tolerate to a certain extent the issues that crop up with it, but they definitely tarnish the beautiful lustrous sheen that this game had and really could have had if not for that one pretty big issue. I'd like to thank all the people supporting this channel on Patreon, including the producer level pledges. If you too would like to directly support the channel, you could do it at patreon.com slash johngetsgames. Also, if you'd like to see more in-depth board game reviews like this one, as well as full game playthroughs and blogs, please subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching.